The men rapidly picked out their horses in the semi-darkness, tightened their saddle girths, and formed companies. Denisov stood by the watchman's hut giving final orders. The infantry of the detachment passed along the road and quickly disappeared among the trees in the midst of early dawn, hundreds of feet splashing through the mud. The Esol gave some orders to his men. Petya held his horse by the bridle, impatiently awaiting the order to mount. His face, having been bathed in cold water, was all aglow, and his eyes were particularly brilliant. Cold shivers ran down his spine, and his whole body pulsed rhythmically. "'Well, is everything ready?' asked Denisov. "'Bring the horses!' The horses were brought. Denisov was angry with the Cossack, because the saddle girths were too slack, reproved him, and mounted. Petya put his foot in the stirrup. His horse, by habit, made as if to nip his leg, but Petya leaped quickly into the saddle, unconscious of his own weight, and, turning to look at the hussars, starting in the darkness behind him, rode up to Denisov. "'Vasily Dmitrich, entrust me with some commission, please, for God's sake,' said he. Denisov seemed to have forgotten Petya's very existence. He turned to glance at him. "'I ask one thing of you,' he said sternly, "'to obey me and not shove yourself forward anywhere.' He did not say another word to Petya, but rode in silence all the way. When they had come to the edge of the forest, it was noticeably growing light over the field. Denisov talked in whispers with the easel, and the Cossacks rode past Petya and Denisov. When they had all ridden by, Denisov touched his horse and rode down the hill. Slipping onto their haunches and sliding, the horses descended with their riders into the ravine. Petya rode beside Denisov, the pulsation of his body constantly increasing. It was getting lighter and lighter, but the mist still hid distant objects. Having reached the valley, Denisov looked back and nodded to a Cossack behind him. The signal, said he. The Cossack raised his arm and a shot rang out. In an instant, the tramp of horses galloping forward was heard. Shouts came from various sides, and then more shots. At the first sound of trampling hoofs and shouting, Petya lashed his horse and, loosening his rein, galloped forward, not heeding Denisov who shouted at him. It seemed to Petya that at the moment the shot was fired, it suddenly became as bright as noon. He galloped to the bridge. Cossacks were galloping along the road in front of him. On the bridge he collided with the Cossack who had fallen behind, but he galloped on. In front of him soldiers, probably Frenchmen, were running from right to left across the road. One of them fell in the mud under his horse's feet. Cossacks were crowding about a hut, busy with something. From the midst of that crowd terrible screams arose. Petya galloped up, and the first thing he saw was the pale face and trembling jaw of a Frenchman clutching the handle of a lance that had been aimed at him. Hurrah! Lads! Ours! shouted Petya, and giving rein to his excited horse, he galloped forward along the village street. He could hear shooting ahead of him. Cossacks, hussars, and ragged Russian prisoners, who had come running from both sides of the road, were shouting something loudly and incoherently. A gallant-looking Frenchman, in a blue overcoat, capless, and with a frowning red face, had been defending himself against the hussars. When Petya galloped up, the Frenchman had already fallen. Too late again, flashed through Petya's mind, and he galloped on to the place from which the rapid firing could be heard. The shots came from the yard of the landowner's house he had visited the night before with Dolokhov. The French were making a stand there behind a wattle fence in a garden, thickly overgrown with bushes, and were firing at the Cossacks who crowded at the gateway. Through the smoke, as he approached the gate, Petya saw Dolokhov, whose face was of a pale greenish tint, shouting to his men. "'Go round! Wait for the infantry!' he exclaimed as Petya rode up to him. "'Wait?' "'Hurrah!' shouted Petya, and without pausing a moment galloped to the place whence the sounds of firing and where the smoke was thickest. A volley was heard, and some bullets whistled past, while others plashed against something. The Cossacks and Dolokhov galloped after Petya into the gateway of the courtyard. In the dense, wavering smoke, some of the French threw down their arms and ran out of the bushes to meet the Cossacks, while others ran down the hill toward the pond. Petya was galloping along the courtyard, but instead of holding the reins, he waved both his arms about rapidly and strangely, 
slipping farther and farther to one side in his saddle. His horse, having galloped up to a campfire that was smouldering in the morning light, stopped suddenly, and Petya fell heavily onto the wet ground. The Cossack saw that his arms and legs jerked rapidly, though his head was quite motionless. A bullet had pierced his skull. After speaking to the senior French officer, who came out of the house with a white handkerchief tied to his sword, and announced that they surrendered, Dolokhov dismounted and went up to Petya, who lay motionless, with outstretched arms. Done for, he said with a frown, and went to the gate to meet Denisov, who was riding toward him. Killed? cried Denisov, recognizing from a distance the unmistakably lifeless attitude, very familiar to him, in which Petya's body was lying. Done for repeated Dolokhov, as if the utterance of these words afforded him pleasure, and he went quickly up to the prisoners, who were surrounded by Cossacks who had hurried up. "'We won't take them,' he called out to Denisov. Denisov did not reply. He rode up to Petya, dismounted, and with trembling hands, turned toward himself the blood-stained, mud-bespattered face, which had already gone white. "'I am used to something sweet. Raisins, fine ones, take them all,' he recalled Petya's words." and the Cossacks looked round in surprise at the sound, like the yelp of a dog, with which Denisov turned away, walked to the wattle fence and seized hold of it. Among the Russian prisoners rescued by Denisov and Dolokhov was Pierre Bezukhov. End of chapter 11 This recording is in the public domain. War and Peace, Book 14, Chapter 12, read for LibriVox.org by Kate McKenzie. During the whole of their march from Moscow, no fresh orders had been issued by the French authorities concerning the party of prisoners, among whom was Pierre. On the 22nd of October, that party was no longer with the same troops and baggage trains with which it had left Moscow. Half the wagons laden with hardtack that had travelled the first stages with them had been captured by Cossacks, the other half had gone on ahead. Not one of those dismounted cavalrymen who had marched in front of the prisoners was left. They had all disappeared. The artillery the prisoners had seen in front of them during the first days was now replaced by Marshal Junot's enormous baggage train convoyed by Westphalians. Behind the prisoners came a cavalry baggage train. From Vyazma onwards, the French army, which till, till then moved in three columns, went on as a single group. The symptoms of disorder that Pierre had noticed at their first halting place after leaving Moscow had now reached the utmost limit. The road along which they moved was bordered on both sides by dead horses. Ragged men who had fallen behind from various regiments continually changed about, now joining the moving column, now again lagging behind it. Several times during the march, False alarms had been given, and the soldiers of the escort had raised their muskets, fired, and run headlong, crushing one another, but had afterwards reassembled and abused each other for their causeless panic. These three groups travelling together, the cavalry stores, the convoy of prisoners, and Junot's baggage train, still constituted a separate and united whole, though each of the groups was rapidly melting away. Of the artillery baggage train, which had consisted of a hundred and twenty wagons, not more than sixty now remained. The rest had been captured or left behind. Some of Junot's wagons also had been captured or abandoned. Three wagons had been raided and robbed by stragglers from Davout's corps. From the talk of the Germans, Pierre learned that a larger guard had been allotted to that baggage train than to the prisoners, and that one of their comrades, a German soldier, had been shot by the marshal's own order, because a silver spoon belonging to the marshal had been found in his possession. The group of prisoners had melted away most of all. Of the 330 men who had set out from Moscow, fewer than a hundred now remained. The prisoners were more burdensome to the escort than even the cavalry saddles or Junot's baggage. They understood that the saddles and Junot's spoon might be of some use, but that cold and hungry soldiers should have to stand and guard equally cold and hungry Russians who froze and lagged behind on the road, in which case the order was to shoot them, was not merely incomprehensible, but revolting. 
and the escort, as if afraid, in the grievous condition they themselves were in, of giving way to the pity they felt for the prisoners, or so rendering their own plight still worse, treated them with particular moroseness and severity. At the Rogobouge, while the soldiers of the convoy, after locking the prisoners in a stable, had gone off to pillage their own stores, several of the soldier prisoners tunnelled under the wall and ran away, but were recaptured by the French and shot. The arrangement adopted when they started, that the officer prisoners should be kept separate from the rest, had long since been abandoned. All who could walk went together, and after the third stage Pierre had rejoined Karatayev and the grey-blue bandy-legged dog that had chosen Karatayev for its master. On the third day after leaving Moscow, Karatayev again fell ill with the fever he had suffered from in the hospital in Moscow, and as he grew gradually weaker, Pierre kept away from him. Pierre did not know why, but since Karatayev had begun to grow weaker, it had cost him an effort to go near him. When he did so and heard the subdued moaning with which Karatayev generally lay down at the halting places, and when he smelled the odour emanating from him which was now stronger than before, Pierre moved farther away and did not think about him. While imprisoned in the shed, Pierre had learned not with his intellect, but with his whole being, by life itself, that man is created for happiness, that happiness is within him, in the satisfaction of simple human needs, and that all unhappiness arises not from privation, but from superfluity. And now, during these last three weeks of the march, he had learned still another new, consolatory truth, that nothing in this world is terrible. He had learned that as there is no condition in which man can be happy and entirely free, so there is no condition in which he need be unhappy and lack freedom. He learned that suffering and freedom have their limits, and that those limits are very near together. That the person in a bed of roses with one crumpled petal suffered as keenly as he now, sleeping on the bare damp earth with one side growing chilled while the other was warming. And that when he had put on tight dancing shoes, he had suffered just as he did now, when he walked with bare feet that were covered with sores, his footgear having long since fallen to pieces. He discovered that when he had married his wife, of his own free will as it had seemed to him, he had been no more free than now when they locked him up at night in a stable. Of all that he himself subsequently termed his sufferings, but which at the time he scarcely felt, the worst was the state of his bare, raw and scab-covered feet. The horse flesh was appetizing and nourishing, the saltpeter flavour of the gunpowder they used instead of salt was even pleasant. There was no great cold, it was always warm walking in the daytime, and at night there were the campfires. The lice that devoured him warmed his body. The one thing that was at first hard to bear was his feet. After the second day's march, Pierre, having examined his feet by the campfire, thought it would be impossible to walk on them. But when everybody got up, he went along, limping, and, when he had warmed up, walked without feeling the pain, though at night his feet were more terrible to look at than before. However, he did not look at them now, but thought of other things. Only now did Pierre realise the full strength of life in man, and the saving power he has of transferring his attention from one thing to another, which is like the safety valve of a boiler, that allows superfluous steam to blow off when the pressure exceeds a certain limit. He did not see, and did not hear, how they shot the prisoners who lagged behind, though more than a hundred perished in that way. He did not think of Karatayev, who grew weaker every day, and evidently would soon have to share that fate. Still less did Pierre think about himself. The harder his position became, and the more terrible the future, the more independent of that position in which he found himself were the joyful and comforting things, memories, and imaginings that came to him. End of chapter 12. This recording is in the public domain. War and Peace, Book 14, Chapter 13, read for LibriVox.org by Kate McKenzie. At midday on the 22nd of October, Pierre was going uphill along the muddy, slippery road, looking at his feet and at the roughness of the way. Occasionally, he glanced at the familiar crowd around him, and then again at his feet. The former and the latter were alike familiar and his own. 
the blue-gray bandy-legged dog ran merrily along the side of the road, sometimes, in proof of its agility and self-satisfaction, lifting one hind leg and hopping along on three, and then again going on all four and rushing to bark at the crows that sat on the carrion. The dog was merrier and sleeker than it had been in Moscow. All around lay the flesh of different animals, from men to horses, in various stages of decomposition. And as the wolves were kept off by the passing men, the dog could eat all it wanted. It had been raining since morning, and had seemed as if at any moment it might cease and the sky clear, but after a short break it began raining harder than before. The saturated road no longer absorbed the water, which ran along the ruts in streams. Pierre walked along, looking from side to side, counting his steps in threes, and reckoning them off on his fingers. Mentally addressing the rain, he repeated, Now then, now then, go on, pelt harder. It seemed to him that he was thinking of nothing, but far down and deep within him, his soul was occupied with something important and comforting. This something was a most subtle spiritual deduction from a conversation with Karateyev the day before. At their yesterday's halting place, feeling chilly by a dying campfire, Pierre had got up and gone to the next one, which was burning better. There, Platon Karateyev was sitting covered up, head and all, with his greatcoat as if it were a vestment, telling the soldiers in his effective and pleasant, though now feeble voice, a story Pierre knew. It was already past midnight, the hour when Karateyev was usually free of his fever and particularly lively. When Pierre reached his fire, and heard Platon's voice enfeebled by illness, and saw his pathetic face, brightly lit up by the blaze, he felt a painful prick at his heart. His feeling of pity for this man frightened him, and he wished to go away. But there was no other fire, and Pierre sat down, trying not to look at Platon. "'Well, how are you?' he asked. "'How am I? If we grumble at sickness, God won't grant us death.' replied Platon, and at once resumed the story he had begun. "'And so, brother,' he continued with a smile on his pale, emaciated face, and a particularly happy light in his eyes, "'You see, brother,' Pierre had long been familiar with that story. Karatayev had told it to him alone, some half-dozen times, and always with a specially joyful emotion. But well as he knew it, Pierre now listened to that tale as to something new, and the quiet rapture Karatayev evidently felt as he told it, communicated itself also to Pierre. The story was of an old merchant who lived a good and God-fearing life with his family, and who went once to the Nizhny fair with a companion, a rich merchant. Having put up at an inn, they both went to sleep, and next morning his companion was found robbed and with his throat cut. A blood-stained knife was found under the old merchant's pillow. He was tried mounted, and his nostrils having been torn off, all in due form, as Karatev put it, he was sent to hard labour in Siberia. And so, brother, it was at this point that Pierre came up, ten years or more passed by. The old man was living as a convict, submitting as he should, and doing no wrong. Only he prayed to God for death. Well, one night the convicts were gathered just as we are, with the old man among them and they began telling what each was suffering for and how they had sinned against god one told how he had taken a life another had taken two a third had set a house on fire while another had simply been a vagrant and had done nothing so they asked the old man what are you being punished for daddy i my dear brothers said he am being punished for my own and other men's sins but I have not killed anyone, or taken anything that was not mine, but have only helped my poorer brothers. I was a merchant, my dear brothers, and had much property. And he went on to tell them all about it in due order. I don't grieve for myself, he says. God, it seems, has chastened me. Only I am sorry for my old wife and the children. And the old man began to weep. Now it happened that in the group was the very man who had killed the other merchant. "'Where did it happen, Daddy?' he said. "'When and in what month?' He asked all about it, and his heart began to ache. So he comes up to the old man like this and falls down at his feet. 
You are perishing because of me, Daddy, he says. It's quite true, lads, that this man, he says, is being tortured innocently and for nothing. I, he says, did that deed, and I put the knife under your head while you were asleep. Forgive me, Daddy, he says, for Christ's sake. Karatayev paused, smiling joyously as he gazed into the fire, and he drew the logs together. And the old man said, God will forgive you. We are all sinners in his sight. I suffer for my own sins. And he wept bitter tears. Well, and what do you think, dear friends? Karatayev continued, his face brightening more and more with a rapturous smile, as if what he now had to tell contained the chief charm and the whole meaning of his story. What do you think, dear fellows? That murderer confessed to the authorities. I have taken six lives, he says. He was a great sinner. But what I am most sorry for is this old man. Don't let him suffer because of me. So he confessed, and it was all written down, and the papers sent off in due form. The place was a long way off, and while they were judging, what with one thing and another, filling in the papers all in due form, the authorities, I mean, time passed. The affair reached the Tsar. After a while, the Tsar's decree came to set the merchant free and give him a compensation that had been awarded. The paper arrived, and they began to look for the old man. Where is the old man who has been suffering innocently in vain? A paper has come from the Tsar. So they began looking for him. Here, Karatayev's lower jaw trembled. But God had already forgiven him. He was dead. That's how it was, dear fellows. Karatev concluded, and sat for a long time silent, gazing before him with a smile. And Pierre's soul was dimly but joyfully filled, not by the story itself, but by its mysterious significance, by the rapturous joy that lit up Karatev's face as he told it, and the mystic significance of that joy. End of chapter 13. This recording is in the public domain. War and Peace, Book 14, Chapter 14, read for LibriVox.org by Kate McKenzie. Ava Blas! suddenly cried a voice. To your places. A pleasant feeling of excitement and an expectation of something joyful and solemn was aroused among the soldiers of the convoy and the prisoners. From all sides came shouts of command, and from the left came smartly dressed cavalrymen on good horses, passing the prisoners at a trot. The expression on all faces showed the tension people feel at the approach of those in authority. The prisoners thronged together and were pushed off the road. The convoy formed up. The Emperor, the Emperor, the Marshal, the Duke! And hardly had the sleek cavalry passed before a carriage drawn by six grey horses rattled by. Pierre caught a glimpse of a man in a three-cornered hat with a tranquil look on his handsome plump white face. It was one of the marshals. His eye fell on Pierre's large and striking figure, and in the expression with which he frowned and looked away, Pierre thought he detected sympathy, and a desire to conceal that sympathy. The general in charge of the stores galloped after the carriage with a red and frightened face, whipping up his skinny horse. Several officers formed a group, and some soldiers crowded round them. Their faces all looked excited and worried. What did he say? What did he say? Pierre heard them ask. While the marshal was passing, the prisoners had huddled together in a crowd, and Pierre saw Karatayev, whom he had not yet seen that morning. He sat in his short overcoat leaning against a birch tree. On his face, besides the look of joyful emotion it had worn yesterday while telling the tale of the merchant who suffered innocently, there was now an expression of quiet solemnity. Karatayev looked at Pierre, with his kindly round eyes now filled with tears, evidently wishing him to come near that he might say something to him. But Pierre was not sufficiently sure of himself. He made as if he did not notice that look and moved hastily away. When the prisoners again went forward, Pierre looked round. Karatayev was still sitting at the side of the road under the birch tree, and two Frenchmen were talking over his head. Pierre did not look round again, but went limping up the hill. From behind, where Karatayev had been sitting, came the sound of a shot. Pierre heard it plainly, but at that moment he remembered that he had not yet finished reckoning up how many stages still remained through Smolensk, a calculation he had begun before the marshal went by, and he again started reckoning. 
Two French soldiers ran past Pierre, one of whom carried a lowered and smoking gun. They both looked pale, and in the expression on their faces, one of them glanced timidly at Pierre, there was something resembling what he had seen on the face of the young soldier at the execution. Pierre looked at the soldier and remembered that, two days before, that man had burned his shirt whilst drying it at the fire, and how they had laughed at him. Behind him, where Karatev had been sitting, the dog began to howl. What a stupid beast! Why is it howling? thought Pierre. His comrades, the prisoner soldiers walking beside him, avoided looking back at the place where the shot had been fired and the dog was howling, just as Pierre did. But there was a set look on all their faces. End of chapter 14 This recording is in the public domain. War and Peace, Book 14, Chapter 15 Read for LibriVox.org by Laurie Ann Walden The stores, the prisoners, and the marshal's baggage train stopped at the village of Shamshevo. The men crowded together round the campfires. Pierre went up to the fire, ate some roast horse flesh, lay down with his back to the fire, and immediately fell asleep. He again slept as he had done at Mozhaisk after the Battle of Borodino. Again, real events mingled with dreams, and again, someone, he or another, gave expression to his thoughts, and even to the same thoughts that had been expressed in his dream at Mozhaisk. Life is everything. Life is God. Everything changes and moves, and that movement is God. And while there is life, there is joy in consciousness of the divine. To love life is to love God. Harder and more blessed than all else is to love this life in one's sufferings, in innocent sufferings. Karatiev came to Pierre's mind. And suddenly he saw vividly before him a long-forgotten, kindly old man who had given him geography lessons in Switzerland. Wait a bit, said the old man, and showed Pierre a globe. This globe was alive, a vibrating ball without fixed dimensions. Its whole surface consisted of drops closely pressed together, and all these drops moved and changed places, sometimes several of them merging into one, sometimes one dividing into many. Each drop tried to spread out and occupy as much space as possible, but others, striving to do the same, compressed it, sometimes destroyed it, and sometimes merged with it. That is life, said the old teacher. How simple and clear it is, thought Pierre. How is it I did not know it before? God is in the midst, and each drop tries to expand so as to reflect him to the greatest extent. And it grows, merges, disappears from the surface, sinks to the depths, and again emerges. There now, Karatiev has spread out and disappeared. Do you understand, my child? said the teacher. "'Do you understand, damn you?' shouted a voice, and Pierre woke up. He lifted himself and sat up. A Frenchman, who had just pushed a Russian soldier away, was squatting by the fire, engaged in roasting a piece of meat stuck on a ramrod. His sleeves were rolled up, and his sinewy, hairy, red hands with their short fingers deftly turned the ramrod. His brown, morose face with frowning brows was clearly visible by the glow of the charcoal." It's all the same to him, he muttered, turning quickly to a soldier who stood behind him. Brigand, get away! And twisting the ramrod, he looked gloomily at Pierre, who turned away and gazed into the darkness. A prisoner, the Russian soldier the Frenchman had pushed away, was sitting near the fire patting something with his hand. Looking more closely, Pierre recognized the blue-gray dog, sitting beside the soldier, wagging its tail. Ah, he's come, said Pierre. And Platt, he began, but did not finish. Suddenly and simultaneously, a crowd of memories awoke in his fancy, of the look Platon had given him as he sat under the tree, of the shot heard from that spot, of the dog's howl, of the guilty faces of the two Frenchmen as they ran past him, of the lowered and smoking gun, and of Karatiev's absence at this halt and he was on the point of realizing that Karatiev had been killed. But just at that instant, he knew not why, 
The recollection came to his mind of a summer evening he had spent with a beautiful Polish lady in the veranda of his house in Kiev. And without linking up the events of the day or drawing a conclusion from them, Pierre closed his eyes, seeing a vision of the country in summertime, mingled with memories of bathing and of the liquid, vibrating globe. And he sank into water so that it closed over his head. Before sunrise he was awakened by shouts and loud and rapid firing. French soldiers were running past him. "'The Cossacks!' one of them shouted, and a moment later a crowd of Russians surrounded Pierre. For a long time he could not understand what was happening to him. All around he heard his comrades sobbing with joy. "'Brothers, dear fellows, darlings!' old soldiers exclaimed, weeping, as they embraced Cossacks and Hussars. The Hussars and Cossacks crowded round the prisoners. One offered them clothes, another boots, and a third bread. Pierre sobbed as he sat among them and could not utter a word. He hugged the first soldier who approached him and kissed him, weeping. Dolokhov stood at the gate of the ruined house, letting a crowd of disarmed Frenchmen pass by. The French, excited by all that had happened, were talking loudly among themselves. But as they passed Dolokhov, who gently switched his boots with his whip and watched them with cold, glassy eyes that boded no good, they became silent. On the opposite side stood Dolokhov's Cossack, counting the prisoners and marking off each hundred with a chalk line on the gate. "'How many?' Dolokhov asked the Cossack. "'The second hundred, replied the Cossack. Filet, filet, get along, get along, Dolokhov kept saying, having adopted this expression from the French, and when his eyes met those of the prisoners, they flashed with a cruel light. Denisov, bareheaded and with a gloomy face, walked behind some Cossacks who were carrying the body of Petya Rostov to a hole that had been dug in the garden. End of chapter 15. This recording is in the public domain. War and Peace, Book 14, Chapter 16, read for LibriVox.org by Laurie Ann Walden. After the 28th of October, when the frosts began, the flight of the French assumed a still more tragic character, with men freezing or roasting themselves to death at the campfires, while carriages with people dressed in furs continued to drive past, carrying away the property that had been stolen by the emperor, kings, and dukes. But the process of the flight and disintegration of the French army went on essentially as before. From Moscow to Viasma, the French army of 73,000 men, not reckoning the guards, who did nothing during the whole war but pillage, was reduced to 36,000, though not more than 5,000 had fallen in battle. From this beginning, the succeeding terms of the progression could be determined mathematically. The French army melted away and perished at the same rate from Moscow to Vyazma, from Vyazma to Smolensk, from Smolensk to the Berezina, and from the Berezina to Vilna, independently of the greater or lesser intensity of the cold, the pursuit, the barring of the way, or any other particular conditions. Beyond Vyazma, the French army, instead of moving in three columns, huddled together into one mass, and so went on to the end. Berthier wrote to his emperor, We know how far commanding officers allow themselves to diverge from the truth in describing the condition of an army. And this is what he said, I deem it my duty to report to your majesty the condition of the various corps I have had occasion to observe during different stages of the last two or three days' march. They are almost disbanded. Scarcely a quarter of the soldiers remain with the standards of their regiments. The others go off by themselves in different directions, hoping to find food and escape discipline. In general, they regard Smolensk as the place where they hope to recover. During the last few days, many of the men have been seen to throw away their cartridges and their arms. In such a state of affairs, whatever your ultimate plans may be, the interest of Your Majesty's service demands that the army should be rallied at Smolensk and should first of all be freed from ineffectives, such as dismounted cavalry, unnecessary baggage, and artillery material that is no longer in proportion to the present forces. 
The soldiers, who are worn out with hunger and fatigue, need these supplies, as well as a few days' rest. Many have died last days on the road or at the bivouacs. This state of things is continually becoming worse, and makes one fear that unless a prompt remedy is applied, the troops will no longer be under control in case of an engagement. November 9, 20 miles from Smolensk. After staggering into Smolensk, which seemed to them a promised land, the French, searching for food, killed one another, sacked their own stores, and when everything had been plundered, fled farther. They all went without knowing whither or why they were going. Still less did that genius Napoleon know it, for no one issued any orders to him. But still he and those about him retained their old habits, wrote commands, letters, reports, and orders of the day, called one another Sire, Mon Cousin, Prince de Moule, Roy de Naples, and so on. But these orders and reports were only on paper. Nothing in them was acted upon, for they could not be carried out. And though they entitled one another, majesties, highnesses, or cousins, they all felt that they were miserable wretches who had done much evil for which they had now to pay. And though they pretended to be concerned about the army, each was thinking only of himself and of how to get away quickly and save himself. End of chapter 16. This recording is in the public domain. War and Peace, Book 14, Chapter 17, read for LibriVox.org by Anna Simon. The movements of the Russian and French armies during the campaign from Moscow back to the Niemen were like those in a game of Russian blind man's bluff, in which two players are blindfolded, and one of them occasionally rings a little bell to inform the catcher of his whereabouts. First he rings his bell fearlessly, but when he gets into a tight place he runs away as quietly as he can, and often thinking to escape runs straight into his opponent's arms. At first, while they were still moving along the Kaluga road, Napoleon's armies made their presence known, but later, when they reached the Smolensk road, they ran holding the clapper of their belt tight, and often thinking they were escaping, ran right into the Russians. Owing to the rapidity of the French flight, and the Russian pursuit, and the consequent exhaustion of the horses, the chief means of approximately ascertaining the enemy's position, by cavalry scouting, was not available. Besides, as a result of the frequent and rapid change of position by each army, even what information was obtained could not be delivered in time. If news was received one day that the enemy had been in a certain position the day before, by the third day, when something could have been done, that army was already two days' march farther on and in quite another position. One army fled and the other pursued. Beyond Smolensk, there were several different roads available for the French, and one would have thought that during their stay of four days they might have learned where the enemy was, might have arranged some more advantageous plan and undertaken something new. But after a four days' halt, the mob, with no maneuvers or plans, again began running along the beaten track, neither to the right nor to the left, but along the old, the worst, road, through Krasnoe and Orsha. Expecting the enemy from behind and not in front, the French separated in their flight and spread out over a distance of twenty-four hours. In front of them all fled the emperor, then the kings, then the dukes. The Russian army, expecting Napoleon to take the road to the right beyond the Dnieper, which was the only reasonable thing for him to do, themselves turned to the right and came out onto the high road at Krasnoe. And here, as in a game of blind man's bluff, the French ran into our vanguard. Seeing their enemy unexpectedly, the French fell into confusion and stopped short from the sudden fright, but then they resumed their flight, abandoning their comrades who were farther behind. Then, for three days, separate portions of the French army, first Murras, the vice-kings, then Davaus, and then Nays, ran, as it were, the gauntlet of the Russian army. They abandoned one another, abandoned all their heavy baggage, their artillery, and half their men, and fled, getting past the Russians by night by making semicircles to the right. Ney, who came last, had been busying himself blowing up the walls of Smolensk, which were in nobody's way, because despite the unfortunate plight of the French, or because of it, they wished to punish the floor against which they had hurt themselves. 
Ney, who had had a corps of ten thousand men, reached Napoleon at Orsha with only one thousand men left, having abandoned all the rest and all his cannon, and having crossed the Dnieper at night by stealth at a wooded spot. From Orsha, they fled farther along the road to Vilna, still playing at Blindman's Bluff with the pursuing army. At the Berezina, they again became disorganized. Many were drowned, and many surrendered, but those who got across the river fled farther. Their supreme chief donned the fur coat, and, having seated himself in a sleigh, galloped on alone, abandoning his companions. The others who could do so drove away too, leaving those who could not to surrender or die. End of chapter 17《War and Peace》Book 14 Chapter 18 Read for LibriVox.org by Anna Simon This campaign consisted in a flight of the French during which they did all they could to destroy themselves. From the time they turned on to the Kaluga road to the day their leader fled from the army, none of the movements of the crowd had any sense. So one might have thought that regarding this period of the campaign, the historians, who attributed the actions of the mass to the will of one man, would have found it impossible to make the story of the retreat fit their theory. But no, mountains of books have been written by the historians about this campaign, and everywhere are described Napoleon's arrangements, the manoeuvres, and his profound plans which guided the army, as well as the military genius shown by his marshals. The retreat from Maloyaroslavitz, when he had a free road into a well-supplied district, and the parallel road was open to him along which Kutuzov afterwards pursued him. This unnecessary retreat along a devastated road is explained to us as being due to profound considerations. Similarly profound considerations are given for his retreat from Smolensk to Orsha. Then his heroism at Krasnoe is described, where he is reported to have been prepared to accept battle and take personal command and to have walked about with a birch stick and said, J'ai assez fait l'empereur, il est temps de faire le général. Translation, I have acted the emperor long enough, it is time to act the general. But nevertheless, immediately ran away again, abandoning to its fate the scattered fragments of the army he left behind. Then we are told of the greatness of soul of the marshals, especially of Ney, a greatness of soul consisting in this, that he made his way by night around through the forest and across the Dnieper and escaped to Orsha, abandoning standards, artillery, and nine-tenths of his men. And lastly, the final departure of the great emperor from his heroic army is presented to us by the historians as something great and characteristic of genius. Even that final running away, described in ordinary language as the lowest death of baseness which every child is taught to be ashamed of, even that act finds justification in the historian's language, when it is impossible to stretch the very elastic threads of historical ratiocination any farther, when actions are clearly contrary to all that humanity calls right or even just. The historians produce a saving conception of greatness. Greatness, it seems, excludes the standards of right and wrong. For the great man, nothing is wrong. There is no atrocity for which a great man can be blamed. C'est grand, translated, it is great, say the historians. And there no longer exists either good or evil, but only grand and not grand. Grand is good not grand is bad. Grand is the characteristic, in their conception, of some special animals called heroes. And Napoleon, escaping home in a warm fur coat, and leaving to perish those who were not merely his comrades, but were, in his opinion, men he had brought there, feels que c'est grand, translated, that it is great, and his soul is tranquil. Le sublime, he saw something sublime in himself, au ridicule, il n'y a qu'un pas, said he. Translated, from the sublime to the ridiculous is but a step. And the whole world for fifty years has been repeating, sublime, grand, 
Napoleon le Grand. Du sublime au ridicule, il n'y a qu'un pas. And it occurs to no one that to admit a greatness not commensurable with the standard of right and wrong is merely to admit one's own nothingness and immeasurable meanness. For us, with the standard of good and evil given us by Christ, no human actions are incommensurable, and there is no greatness where simplicity, goodness, and truth are absent. End of chapter 18「War and Peace」Book 14 Chapter 19 Read for LibriVox.org by Kate McKenzie What Russian, reading the account of the last part of the campaign of 1812, has not experienced an uncomfortable feeling of regret, dissatisfaction, and perplexity? Who has not asked himself how it is that the French were not all captured or destroyed when our three armies surrounded them in superior numbers, when the disordered French, hungry and freezing, surrendered in crowds, and when, as the historians relate, the aim of the Russians was to stop the French to cut them off and capture them all. How was it that the Russian army, which, when numerically weaker than the French, had given battle at Borodino, did not achieve its purpose when it had surrounded the French on three sides, and when its aim was to capture them? Can the French be so enormously superior to us, that when we had surrounded them with superior forces we could not beat them? How could that happen? History, or what is called by that name, replying to these questions, says that this occurred because Kutuzov, and Tormasov, and Chichagov, and this man and that man, did not execute such and such manoeuvres. But why did they not execute those manoeuvres, and why, if they were guilty of not carrying out a prearranged plan, were they not tried and punished? But, even if we admitted that Kutuzov, Chichagov, and others were the cause of the Russian failures, it is still incomprehensible why, the position of the Russian army being what it was at Krasnoye and at the Berezina, in both cases we had superior forces. The French army with its marshals, kings, and emperor was not captured, if that was what the Russians aimed at. The explanation of this strange fact given by Russian military historians, to the effect that Kutuzov hems an attack, is unfounded, for we know that he could not restrain the troops from attacking at Vyazma and Tarutino. Why was the Russian army, which with inferior forces had withstood the enemy in full strength at Borodino, defeated at Krasnoye and the Berezina by the disorganized crowds of the French when it was numerically superior? If the aim of the Russians consisted in cutting off and capturing Napoleon and his marshals, and that aim was not merely frustrated, but all attempts to attain it were most shamefully baffled, then this last period of the campaign is quite rightly considered by the French to be a series of victories, and quite wrongly considered victorious by Russian historians. The Russian military historians, insofar as they submit to claims of logic, must admit that conclusion, and in spite of their lyrical rhapsodies about valor, devotion, and so forth, must reluctantly admit that the French retreat from Moscow was a series of victories for Napoleon and defeats for Kutuzov. But, putting national vanity entirely aside, one feels that such a conclusion involves a contradiction, since the series of French victories brought the French complete destruction, while the series of Russian defeats led to the total destruction of their enemy and the liberation of their country. The source of this contradiction lies in the fact that the historians studying the events from the letters of the sovereigns and the generals, from memoirs, reports, projects and so forth, have attributed to this last period of the war of 1812 an aim that never existed namely that of cutting off and capturing Napoleon with his marshals and his army. There never was or could have been such a name, for it would have been senseless and its attainment quite impossible. It would have been senseless, first, because Napoleon's disorganized army was flying from Russia with all possible speed, that is to say, was doing just what every Russian desired. So what was the use of performing various operations on the French, who were running away as fast as they possibly could? Secondly, it would have been senseless to block the passage of men whose whole energy was directed to flight. Thirdly, it would have been senseless to sacrifice one's own troops in order to destroy the French army, which without external interference was destroying itself at such a rate that, though its path was not blocked, it could not carry across the frontier more than it actually did in December, namely, a hundredth part of the original army. Fourthly, it would have been senseless to wish to take captive the emperor, kings and dukes, 
whose capture would have been in the highest degree embarrassing for the Russians, as the most adroit diplomatists of the time, Joseph de Maistre and others, recognized. Still more senseless would have been the wish to capture Army Corps of the French, when our own army had melted away to half before reaching Krasnoye, and a whole division would have been needed to convoy the Corps of prisoners, and when our men were not always getting full rations, and the prisoners, already taken, were perishing of hunger. All the profound plans about cutting off and capturing Napoleon and his army were like the plan of a market gardener who, when driving out of his garden a cow that had trampled down the beds he had planted, should run to the gate and hit the cow on the head. The only thing to be said in excuse of that gardener would be that he was very angry. But not even that could be said for those who drew up this project, for it was not they who had suffered from the trampled beds. But besides the fact that cutting off Napoleon with his army would have been senseless, it was impossible. It was impossible first because, as experience shows that a three-mile movement of columns on a battlefield never coincides with the plans, the probability of Chichagov, Kutuzov, and Wittgenstein effecting a junction on time at an appointed place was so remote as to be tantamount to impossibility, and, as in fact thought Kutuzov, who, when he received the plan, remarked that diversions planned over great distances do not yield the desired results. Secondly, it was impossible, because to paralyze the momentum with which Napoleon's army was retiring, incomparably greater forces than the Russians possessed would have been required. Thirdly, it was impossible, because the military term, to cut off, has no meaning. One can cut off a slice of bread, but not an army. To cut off an army, to bar its road, is quite impossible, for there is always plenty of room to avoid capture, and there is the night when nothing can be seen, as the military scientists might convince themselves by the example of Krasnoye and of the Berezina. It is only possible to capture prisoners if they agree to be captured, just as it is only possible to catch a swallow if it settles on one's hand. Men can only be taken prisoners if they surrender according to the rules of strategy and tactics, as the Germans did. But the French troops quite rightly did not consider that this suited them, since death by hunger and cold awaited them in flight or captivity alike. Fourthly and chiefly it was impossible, because never since the world began has a war been fought under such conditions as those that obtained in 1812, and the Russian army, in its pursuit of the French, strained its strength to the utmost, and could not have done more without destroying itself. During the movement of the Russian army from Tarotino to Krasnoye, it lost 50,000 sick or stragglers. That is a number equal to the population of a large provincial town. Half the men fell out of the army without a battle. And it is of this period of the campaign, when the army lacked boots and sheepskin coats, was short of provision and without vodka, and was camping out at night for months in the snow with 15 degrees of frost, when there were only seven or eight hours of daylight, and the rest was night in which the influence of discipline cannot be maintained, when men were taken into that region of death where discipline fails, not for a few hours only as in a battle, but for months, where they were every moment fighting death from hunger and cold, when half the army perished in a single month. It is of this period of the campaign that the historians tell us how Miloradovich should have made a flank march to such and such a place, Tormasov to another place, and Chichagov should have crossed, more than knee-deep in snow, to somewhere else, and how so-and-so rooted and cut off the French, and so on and so on. The Russians, half of whom died, did all that could and should have been done to attain an end worthy of the nation, and they are not to blame because other Russians, sitting in warm rooms, proposed that they should do what was impossible. All that strange contradiction, now difficult to understand between the facts and the historical accounts, only arises because the historians dealing with the matter have written the history of the beautiful words and sentiments of various generals, and not the history of the events. To them, the words of Miloradovich seem very interesting, and so do their surmises and the rewards this or that general received. But the question of those 50,000 men who were left in hospitals and in graves does not even interest them, for it does not come within the range of their investigation. Yet one need only discard the study of the reports and general plans and consider the movement of those hundreds of thousands of men who took a direct part in the events, and all the questions that seemed insoluble easily and simply receive an immediate and certain solution. The aim of cutting off Napoleon and his army never existed, except in the imaginations of a dozen people. It could not exist, because it was senseless and unattainable. The people had a single aim, to free their land from invasion. That aim was attained in the first place of itself as the French ran away, 
and so it was only necessary not to stop their flight. Secondly, it was attained by the guerrilla warfare which was destroying the French, and thirdly, by the fact that a large Russian army was following the French, ready to use its strength in case their movement stopped. The Russian army had to act like a whip to a running animal, and the experienced driver knew it was better to hold the whip raised as a menace than to strike the running animal on the head. End of chapter 19, recording by Kate McKenzie. End of War and Peace, book 14, by Leo Tolstoy.